Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 AP U.S. Government and Politics Live Reviews. My name is Ashley Vasick, and I'm here from Boonesboro High School in Boonesboro, Maryland. And I'm here with my lovely friend and colleague, Jen. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Jennifer Hitchcock. I am a teacher at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Alexandria, Virginia. Hello, neighbor. Hello, neighbor. We are so Hello. excited to be with you this year. Um, for eight nights, um, we're going to be talking to you about all the wonders of AP U.S. government and politics to prep you for that exam. Each night will feature some content, some skills, and each week we're going to do one of each of the four FRQ types. So you'll get a chance to see and practice eight FRQs, two for each type. Um, tonight, we're going to focus on the concept application. So that is what is exciting and ahead of you. Jen, are you ready to get this show on the road. I mean, yeah, eight FRQs in eight classes. There's just eight. F are there eight FRQs on the exam? No, great question. There's only four, oh, four total that you'll do on the exam. So you'll do your 55 multiple choice in your 80 minutes, and then you'll get to do four FRQs, a concept application, which we're going to look at tonight, a quantitative analysis, my favorite, the data one, um, a data, Supreme data, 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 data. And then we've got our Supreme Court analysis, and then we'll also have our argument essay. So we'll be looking at all of those over the next eight times. Awesome. So we're going to uh -huh. do twice, right? Like, yes, we're gonna go through two of and each. So each Monday, we're going to do concept application. Each Tuesday, we're going to do quantitative. Each Wednesday, that's the next day, <laughs> uh, we'll do Supreme <laughs> Court. And then each Thursday, we're going to do argument essay. So okay. you'll get a chance to try each one and um, test your skills and see if you're ready to go for this exam. Well, that makes sense because the Supreme Court one is the one that makes me the most nervous. So I'll make sure I have my pencil and paper out for that one. Oh, yes, definitely. That the one, that's the one that seems to trip people up the most. So we'll get we'll definitely cover that one very Yay. well in depth. OK, so let's talk about what we're going to talk, what we're going to learn tonight before we dive into the practice FRQ. So tonight we're going to be looking specifically at congressional powers and the structure of Congress. We're going to talk about the powers of Congress. We're going to talk about those two um, hardy clauses, as I like to call them, commerce and necessary and proper. And then if you notice at the um, on the video screen, you're going to see a tiny URL um, throughout um, our sessions this year. We're going to be posting some handouts for you in that folder so you can feel free to access that at any time to see some of the things um, that will be helpful to you as we move forward. Some gifts. I like it. Gifts. Oh, yes. That's a great way to put it. Gifts. Okay, so we can't talk about Congress without talking about the Founding Fathers. And if we're going to talk about the Founding Fathers, we have to talk about James Madison. Most of what we know about the Constitutional Convention comes from his very copious notes that he took. And he had a lot to say in the Federalist Essays. He was the guy in class that you would go to to get the notes. He's the yes. guy. Yes. Um, and he didn't publish any of them because there's secrecy rule and all that good stuff. So we didn't find out about them until much later, which was a good thing. Um, but Ooh. he has a lot of ideas on bicameralism and the idea of having a two house legislature. That was really important to him. Um, and throughout the convention, he really supported this idea of a two house legislature. And um, in Federalist 62, which is not one of our required Federalist essays, he talks about this double security where not only are we going to have a separation of powers between the three branches of government, but we're also going to have a double security within the branches themselves so that the branch itself can check itself and they can check each other. Um, like, a lock, can, like a lock, like a lock within a lock. Love that. Yes. A lock okay. within a lock. That's perfect. Now, the Federalist essays that are required documents for this course that Madison writes are number 10 and number 51. And we'll talk about those later on. Um, but those are um, important ones as well. So this internal legislative separation of powers is really what he's getting at. He wants each chamber, meaning the House and the Senate, to be able to check each other. And when we're talking about the House and Senate checking each other, we call that an intra-branch check. Okay. And if we're talking about Congress, the collective House and Senate checking the other branches, that's going to be called an inter branch check. Mm. Um, so you kind of, it's kind of, and you'll probably have, you've probably heard those um, prefixes. Well, there's my English skills coming in um, before when we were talking about commerce, because we've talked and we will in a minute, but we've talked about interstate and intrastate commerce. Same idea. This is just within the legislative branch or outside of it. Um, his big point about these internal checks is that it's going to combat 
the dangers of factions. And if you are an expert on Federalist 10, which I know you all are, since it's one of our required docs, you already know everything there is to know about factions, the importance of factions, the fact that we need this large republic to control them, because as much as we might want to, we can't eliminate them entirely. Unless we want to get... Go ahead. What did you say? I was going to say, we'd kind of be sad times for all yes. of us. No liberty. Or we'd all be like robots and have the same ideas and same belief systems. And that would be very boring at the very least. So all good things. Um, so this whole idea, Madison, bicameralism, it's a good thing. It's going to be checks. There's going to be separation of powers. And he really supports this at the convention. So again, you probably know this from taking U.S. history as well. Go ahead, Jen. What convention? The Constitutional Convention. Okay, okay, okay. So that's when they were like talking about making the Constitution, but that's not when they ratified it. Exactly, exactly. So this is when they were talking about creating the actual plan for government, not when they got together to say, yes, we want this. Good. So at the Constitutional Convention, there was two main plans for how we could structure this new legislative branch um, that kind of arose. They had the Virginia plan, also known as the large state plan. And we also had the New Jersey plan or the small state plan. So basically why we called them Virginia and New Jersey is basically because the men that proposed them were from those states. And so that's how they got the name. And obviously New Jersey at the time was a small state. Virginia was a large state. So the Virginia plan is going to propose, go ahead, Jen. So uh, when they say big state, small state, are they talking about like geographic size? Not necessarily. They're more or less talking about population. Oh, um, okay. Definitely about population. And that's where that's where this whole debate over how we are going to structure Congress is going to come into play is how many people you have and the concern that these smaller in size population states had for not having enough representation in Congress. So the Virginia plan is going to is going to suggest bicameral, which means two houses. And which we will eventually decide on bicameralism, but not in this exact form. They're going to suggest um, in the Virginia plan that a lower house be elected based on population. So however many people you had in your state, that would determine how many representatives you got in the lower house. Then they suggested that the upper house would be elected by this lower house. So a more indirect election of the upper house. That was the Virginia plan. Obviously, the New Jersey plan is going to be slightly different. They're going to propose a unicameral or one house legislature, very similar to what they had under the Articles of Confederation. Those smaller population states are very concerned about a new national government taking too much power, very similar to some of the concerns of the anti-federalists, and they want to make sure that their interests are going to be protected in this new assembly, this new Congress. And so their suggestion was, let's do one house and let's make it based on equality, two per state. Let's just have two representatives per state, regardless of population. So the New Jersey plan is going to be most mostly resembling the Articles of Confederation. Not exactly, but that's what they like. Yes. So it's the most resembling the articles because the articles had one house Mm -hmm. and equal representation. Like they all had the same number of people like per state. They didn't have the same number per state, but it's (sighs) resembled. Good point. So it did under the articles, we didn't have the same number of representatives per state, but we did have the one house and they could send they could send delegates. It was more the, the resembling of the articles is about the unicameralism of the structure okay. rather than the based on equality. That makes sense. I think I remember my teacher saying that it had it was like anywhere between four and seven. Yes, per that state. Is correct. Okay. Yes, anywhere between four and seven. So more populous states were more likely to send more people, um, but not necessarily. It didn't have to be that way. All right. So we've got these two plans. People that support the New Jersey plan aren't going to support the Virginia plan. People that support the Virginia plan aren't going to support the New Jersey plan. So what are we going to do? We're going to compromise. What a concept. So what's going to happen is we're going to have the Connecticut compromise. Again, state name because of the guy that proposed it. But we all know and love it as the great compromise. Um, It is going to decide that our Congress will be bicameral. It will have two houses. We're going to call the lower house the House of Representatives. We're going to call the upper house the Senate. 
and we're good. This is where the compromise is going to come. So we're going to keep this idea of election based on population in the in the lower house. And in the Senate, we're going to have equality. We're going to give each state two representatives. Now, there were there have been changes to the Senate since this was made. Originally, the Senate, the upper house, was indirect election. So state legislatures would choose their two people to represent them in the state Senate. It's not going to be until the passage of the 17th Amendment that we will see um, direct election of senators by the people, which is what we have today. So both our representatives in the House and our senators are all directly elected by the people. That is why the legislative branch gets um, kind of the moniker of the branch that is closest to the people. We have the most direct access to the members of the legislative branch. Because we vote them into office, right? So it's kind of like that idea of republicanism where you're giving your consent to be governed through every election for a representative. Perfect. Good job talking about two principles of government in that lovely little sentence. We got consent of the governed. We got republicanism on point tonight. Okay, so now that we've decided we're going to have this House and Senate, we've got lots of things to do. We got to give them all this power. And where's all this power going to be? We're going to put it in Article 1, the first of the seven articles of the Constitution. We'll talk a little bit more about generally what that looks like in a moment. But let's look specifically at each house. So the House of Representatives is the larger house. It's based on population. So that only makes sense that it's going to be the larger house. Um, There are 435 members in the House, while there's only 100 in the Senate. In the House, your main leader is going to be a Speaker of the House. And in the Senate, the leadership is a little bit different um, because uh, according to the Constitution, the real, the only real constitutional responsibility of the vice president is to be the president of the Senate. Now, the vice president does not have time to show up to the Senate every time they meet. So one of the things that the vice president, a.k.a. the president of the Senate, is responsible for is to break tie votes in the Senate. So since the vice president isn't the one showing up all the time, they're basically only showing up to break ties, the main um, leadership position in the Senate is going to be the majority leader. Whatever party holds a majority in the Senate, that's the person that's going to be the most like the Speaker of the House. Yes, Jen? I thought it was like that Latin word, that pro tempore thing. Um, The Senate pro tempore. So the Senate pro tempore acts as the overseer. It's usually a senior member um, of the party. Their role is basically, um, I like to tell my students, it's kind of like a glorified sergeant at arms almost. Um, So when the vice president isn't there, the president pro tempore does serve as kind of like the temporary leader, but the person with the real power in the Senate is the majority leader. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes me wonder if it was intended to be that way but maybe Mm. we'll talk about that a different day. Yes, I think we will. Um, Also, shorter terms in the House, two-year terms, so they're re-elected, um, or they can run for re-election every two years. Um, In the Senate, they have to do that every six years. So that means every election, all 435 members of the House of Representatives are up for election or re-election. In the Senate, every election, every two years, a third of them are up for election. So it's um, the Senate is often known as a very prestigious position. Some people even argue it's the most prestigious position other than being president um, because the Senate is kind of this more insulated, more sophisticated body. At least that's the the view of the Senate versus the House. Um, Also in the House, they have a House Rules Committee. As the name suggests, they are there to keep people in line, make sure they're following the rules. They also set the calendar. Um, They you know, when they're going to vote on things, all of those kinds of stuff. Um, They also have very strict rules for debate in the House when you have 435 people. Um, It's kind of like when your teachers may have a class of 30 plus students, and then you have a class with that teacher that might only be 10 students. Your teacher probably acts a little different in the class with 30 plus versus the class of 10 or 15. Um, Because when you have more people, you've got to have more strict rules and be more formal just to keep everybody on the same page. For the most part, we'll talk about how a bill becomes a law in a second, but um, all bills can start in either house. The only exception is that if it's a revenue, a money bill, it's got to start in the House of Representatives. That's the only um, real restriction on where it must start. 
and impeachment joint effort okay power of impeachment um basically the articles of impeachment um get passed by the house and the senate holds any trials for impeachment you also may have heard about some special powers of the senate um they have filibuster okay that's where they can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and if they want to stop that they can have a vote of cloture basically to shut the person up is essentially what that rule is for. <laughs> um, they confirm all presidential appointees. This isn't just members of the Supreme Court. This is cabinet secretaries. Um, you know, anyone that the president appoints, which can be well over several thousand appointees at any point in their term, um, most of them have to be approved by the Senate. Um, so, and they have that special rule as well. All right. Last thing I want to point out about the House and the Senate is this idea of formal powers versus informal powers. And a formal power is either listed in, for Congress at least, is either listed in Article 1, Section 8, or expressed in Article 1. Now, Jen and I had a lovely conversation about expressed and enumerated powers the other day. Mm -hmm. And we both came to the consensus that here's how we are going to distinguish them for you. So enumerated sounds like numbered because that's exactly what it means. So an enumerated power is numbered in the Constitution. So that means all of the powers for Congress listed in Article 1, Section 8 are enumerated powers because they're literally numbered in the Constitution. An expressed power means that it is explicitly written. It's stated in the Constitution. So there are expressed powers in Article 1. There's also expressed powers in Article 2 and in Article 3. So if you want to talk about the difference, so an enumerated power is numbered. So that means an enumerated power is also an expressed power. Okay. But an expressed power is not necessarily enumerated because express just means it's explicitly written or stated in the Constitution. Okay. And then our informal powers of Congress lie in their implied powers, which is primarily through the Necessary and Proper Clause, which we're going to dive into in a second, or the Elastic Clause, um, Congress's power to investigate, and also their power of oversight. Both of those are also implied, which means they're informal, they're not explicitly stated, but based on other powers that are explicitly stated in the Constitution, Congress has these powers. And they're really important, right? Like Congress Very. does it a lot. Oh, yes. Especially, um, and arguably, some argue that oversight is one of the most important powers, even though it's the biggest challenge for Congress uh, to mm -hmm. engage in oversight, simply because the bureaucracy is so large and they have so many other things going on um, that oversight can sometimes get overlooked, despite how important it may be. <laughs> so one more question. Yep. When you say express and enumerated, sometimes my textbook uses one or the other. So is there a way for me to understand this that will make me feel a little more comfortable? Um, I would say if you're talking about what I tell my students is if you're talking about enumerated powers, you're talking about Article One, Section eight congressional powers. If you're talking about expressed powers, you're talking about any power for any part of the government that's written in the Constitution. So for example, um, executive power in Article 2. All executive power is vested within a president of the United States. That's an expressed power. Um, Commander-in-chief, expressed power, because it says in Article 2, that's his power. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think, too, the other way, slipping out of a student role into a teacher role, oh. I might advise and say sometimes they're used interchangeably because mm -hmm. just like any advanced studies of these complex concepts you'll note that definitions aren't always the same and that's kind of crazy that it's like that but I find that a lot of textbooks will use them interchangeably you and I have a very concrete definition of them but sometimes it kind of they just get used interchangeably agreed the lovely English language mm -hmm. <laughs> Love to hate it sometimes. <laughs> okay, so we've already talked a little bit about this, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. But remember, um, seven total articles in the Constitution. The first three talk about each branch of government, legislative, executive, judicial. Article one is the longest and most detailed of the three branch articles. Some people say it's because it's the only real branch of government they had experience with under the articles. And some say because of Madison's influence at the convention, 
the Constitutional Convention. Um, he seemed to have an affinity for the legislative branch. And so maybe that's why there was so much detail in the legislative branch. I've mentioned that generally speaking for the AP government exam, you don't have to know a lot of very specific article section clause numbers, but one you definitely need to know is Article 1, Section 8. That is one you got to know. That's the that's those listed powers of Congress, like levying taxes, coining money, um, regulating commerce, raise an army, establish post offices, you know, the big long list there. Um, another one you might want to make sure that you have in your back pocket is Article 1, Section 9. Um, this is where the denied powers of Congress exist. So not only does Article 1 say what they can do, it also suggests what they can't do, um, which is important um, for limited government. You know, we can have limited government by giving power to the national government. We can also have limiting go limited government by denying certain powers to them. Um, and then more general powers that they have kind of overall, they're in charge of lawmaking. They control the budget. Remember, yes, the U.S. Treasury Department exists. Yes, they print and coin the money, but the m power of the purse is with Congress. They are the ones big that power. decide, yes, they that is their big power. Um, and then obviously they have the oversight power, which we'll talk about soon. Okay, so two big clauses in Article 1, Section 8 that we want to talk about. The first is the Commerce Clause. Um, this literally says Congress can regulate commerce, aka trade, with foreign nations, among the several states, and with Indian tribes. So that is what it literally says in the Constitution. However, there have been some Supreme Court cases that have further kind of um, specified what that exactly means. So one of the ones, again, um, this first one that we're going to talk about, Gibbons v. Ogden, not one of your 15 required cases, but one that really kind of established this idea that this Article 1, Section 8 applies to interstate commerce. That's trade between the states. So this, base, this case basically said in the majority opinion that the national government, i.e. Congress, could regulate trade between states but not necessarily trade within states, okay? Because trade within states would fall under Amendment 10, which is the art, which excuse me, which is the amendment that reserves power to the states. Then later on in 1995, we're going to see U.S. v. Lopez. This is one of your 15 required cases, so it could show up on that SCOTUS FRQ or anywhere within the multiple choice. And this one basically said yes. You know, we agree Congress can regulate interstate between the state's commerce, but there are limits to that. They can't claim anything for interstate commerce. And in U.S. v. Lopez, um, the court said in the majority opinion that the possession of a gun in a local school zone is, quote, in no sense an economic activity. Now, that doesn't mean that schools this is not a gun case. Okay, your teachers probably told you that. U.S. v. Lopez is not a gun case. It's a Commerce Clause case. Okay, so it no Second mean... Amendment? No, not really. <laughs> sorry. Okay. You got to wait for McDonald v. Chicago for that one. Okay. Sorry. Um, basically, it, it, and this case also doesn't say that we should let guns be on school campuses. That's not what it says at all. It's simply saying that not everything can be declared commerce. So that it puts a limit on the Commerce Clause, essentially, and tells Congress you can't just use the Commerce Clause for anything and everything that you want to use it for. You've got to have um, some limits to it. And that's what this case did. So this was a win um, for states, the U.S. v. Lopez. Okay, the granddaddy of them all, as I like to call it, the Necessary and Proper Clause, or the Elastic Clause, the granddaddy, and also one that is very often misunderstood, I feel like, like the middle child, if you're a middle child, I feel like you're always misunderstood. Mm. Um, I'm not a middle child, so I don't know what to tell you, but no, I am not either, so. I'm a firstborn, so, you know, we get Oh my everything. gosh, same. Oh my gosh, we have That's so why we get comments. along so well. Oh. Yes, that's why we get along so well. Okay, so. First off, if anyone tells you that the or excuse me that the necessary and proper clause says that Congress can pass any law they want, you say but after that sentence, okay? No, they can't just pass any law they want anytime they want. It has to be in accordance with those constitutional enumerated powers, powers they already have. The quote here on your screen is exactly what it says, to make laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. It's got to connect back OK, your teachers, I know, taught you McCulloch v. Maryland because that's one of our 15 required cases. OK, this was the one about the National Bank and Maryland, my home state. Um, 
basically saying, you know, the national government wants to establish this national bank. Maryland wasn't too happy about it. So they decided to levy a tax on it. OK, Maryland's argument was you can't have a national bank because the Constitution doesn't say anything about a national bank. OK, so in the majority opinion, the court says, hey, guess what? You're right. It doesn't say anything in the Constitution that we can establish a national bank. But it does say that we can levy taxes, coin money, borrow money, and all of those enumerated powers would be facilitated via a national bank. So you know what? We can do that. Hmm. Now, there's one other clause. Jen, do you know what the other clause is related to McCulloch v. Maryland? Um, I think it's supremacy. Oh, genius. Okay, just as a reminder that necessary and proper is not the only one connected to McCulloch v. Maryland. We've also got supremacy clause that came into play with the taxing portion. So once the court said, hey, we can establish a bank, then they said, guess what, Maryland, you cannot tax it. Okay, because the supremacy clause says if there is a conflict between state and federal law, and obviously if the Maryland government was taxing an entity of the national government, that would be interfering with their power. They don't like that. OK, so McCulloch v. Maryland actually comprises two clauses, necessary and proper and supremacy. It's interesting. So like, OK, Ooh. I just am trying to make sure I have this connecting. Got it. It's like when the government is using the necessary and proper clause, they it's like the necessary and proper clause, whatever it is, mm -hmm. has to be enabling the government to do something that's enumerated. So it's in service of that. Like we have to be able to argue that if a government's passing a law, it's it's to make sure that they're doing something that's in their enumerated powers, like coining money or regulating trade. But you can't reverse it and you can't make trade be a reason to do something that's well beyond the constitution because then it's intruding on the states. Ooh, very astute. Okay. Good job. Thank you. That was Yay. a great way to summarize everything I just said. You're a genius. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I learned it from you. Oh, you're so nice. Okay. Um, we've got authority of Congress. So I mentioned that there's some general authority, legislative power, budget power, oversight power. Legislatively speaking, we know that the main, if we're talking separation of powers, the main power of the legislative branch is make the laws, okay? Making national policy. It can be domestic policy, foreign policy, um, all via their enumerated powers. It's their job to set um, the laws of the country, okay? Um, the budget. Remember, Congress is not alone in the budget process. The executive proposes the budget and then Congress sets it, okay? They control all the money. Nothing gets spent without congressional approval. They have to say yes, okay? Um, and they even have their own budget office. I tell my students the CBO is basically like Congress's accountants. They're the number crunchers. They go ooh, doo, 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 on their little calculators and make sure that we have enough money or at least enough credit. <laughs> We'll see. Um, and then last but not least is oversight. I'm a big fan of oversight. My students think I'm crazy because I think oversight is super interesting, but I'm a governor. So I think everything's interesting. But the job of oversight with as it applies to the bureaucracy is that Congress has to make sure that once they've passed a law, it gets attributed to the appropriate agency, i.e. an environmental law to the Environmental Protection Agency. And then they have to allocate money for that agency to implement the law. Okay, we're going to give you some money, do this. But the oversight comes in when they say, hmm, have you implemented the law the way we intended it to? Or are you wasting money? Or are you doing something that we never intended? And if so, we're going to pull those funds back, or we're going to have a little hearing and find out what you're actually doing, because you're not going to be able to just, you know, make the law. Your job is to implement the law within Congress's intention. So they're going to do that. Um, this, their investigative uh, authority comes over this. This isn't just investigating politicians, though they can investigate elected, elected officials for wrongdoing. Um, it also involves, you know, just making sure those funds are being spent appropriately. If they're going to appropriate the funds, they don't want them just spent willy-nilly. I love that phrase too, willy-nilly. It's fun. All right. Last but not least, I know you guys know this. I am not singing the song, though I am a big fan of 
lovely Schoolhouse Rocks, How a Bill Becomes a Law. I know it's it's playing in your head right now, but we are not going to sing it for you, probably because it violates some kind of copyright. But I'm sure. anyways, remember in the lawmaking process that both chambers are involved. OK, in order for a law to pass, both chambers have to say yes. OK. And then in the very end, the president either gets to say yes or no. And if he says no, um, the legislative branch does have the power to override that no with a two thirds vote. Very difficult to do, but it exists. Um, and remember that anyone can come up with an idea for a bill, which will hopefully eventually become a law, but only members of Congress can introduce them, propose them within each chamber. Um, and that the real work of Congress is done in the committees and arguably the real, real work is done in the subcommittees. So that's where most of it gets done. And ideally the members of Congress that serve on these committees are quote experts um, in that field, or at least they're very passionate or very interested in that area of study. So all good things. Okay, it's about that time. Finally, it's time for the FRQ. So let's review Yay. the concept application. This is the short one, as my students like to call it. They love to talk about this one because it's so short. Um, so the concept application is FRQ number one. It doesn't mean you have to write this one first on the exam. It just means that it is the question number one on the exam. It's the first one you'll see when you open your FRQ booklet. It is three points. And in this FRQ, you are going to be required to do three things. You're going to have to describe, explain, and explain. So yes, you're going to explain twice, but you're going to do it in different ways. Um, so your first describe is you're going to be asked to describe a principle like limited government, an institution like Congress, a process like how bill becomes a law, a policy like the Clean Air and Water Act, or some kind of behavior, how the president and Congress interact with one another, for example. Um, then you're going to have to explain that thing, whatever it was they were talking about. And then you're going to have to explain how or why that would apply in different scenarios. Now, when I say scenario, it means that you're going to get a scenario. There's going to be a passage that you're going to get that you're going to have to refer to. Okay, there's certain things that you got to do in these FRQs that you can't forget. So like, for example, in this one, reference the scenario. You got to do it. In all parts? Not in necessarily in all parts. Not necessarily in all parts. If you see, and we'll look at a prompt in a second, if it says referring to the scenario or based on the scenario in context, definitely. However, I always say it can never hurt to reference the scenario because then you've got it everywhere. Okay. Um, and that's really important because as I like to tell my students, yes, AP readers, which Jen and I both are, we know what the scenario is. We know you see it on your paper, but we need to know when we read your response that you understood it and that you were applying the correct part of the scenario to the questions. So we can't hmm. just assume that you read it and assume that you understand it. You have to show us that you did. So as the writer, I have mm -hmm. to do all of the heavy lifting and I have to show by citing references in the scenario where I see these things. Almost like you can't see the scenario. You, the reader, doesn't know the scenario. Perfect. Okay. And also as the writer, you don't necessarily have to give a direct quote from the scenario. You can, but it's not required. And I'll show you the one, example I'm going to show you tonight does not use a direct quote, but they're still going to earn the point. Um, and yes, we're going to talk about this a lot throughout all eight sessions this year, but don't make the reader guess. If the person reading your FRQ has to try to infer or figure out what you're thinking, you're less likely to get the point. Don't make them question. Make it very clear in your writing. Oh, it's practice time. So let's see if we can rock this first FRQ. So here is our prompt. Now, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading the prompt to you, but I, what I am going to ask you to do is to hit the pause button on your video right now and take about mm, two to three minutes or however long it takes you. I want you to read the scenario on the right side of your screen, and then I want you to read A, B, and C. And Jen and I are going to hum and do things like this while you're reading. All right, so 
Now that you've unpaused, the next thing I want you to do is, and you should do this with all FRQs, is ask yourself, what are my task verbs? What am I being asked to do? So Jen, if we're looking at these A, B, and C, what are my task verbs for this prompt? In A, I mm -hmm. see describe. Mm -hmm. In B, I see explain how. Good. And in C, I also see explain how, which I know there's a difference between explain how and explain why, but mm. I can't remember why. Okay. So if we're explaining why, and I'm not the greatest at explaining the difference, so you correct me when I say this wrong, Jen. <laughs> You're the expert on explain <laughs> why and explain how. I got it. Are you ready? I'll put. Yeah, I'll go you back just roll. Teacher. How about you ready? just go? <laughs> we did this last year. We did. Ashley? How do you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Oh, I remember this now. Yeah. Explain how. Okay, yes. So how is I take two slices of bread. I put peanut butter on one side, jelly on the other. Jelly goes on top. Cut like a triangle, eat. And I don't use any utensils or a plate. I just slather it yeah. on my hand. I just slather it on my, my hand. face. <laughs> I'm not coming over your house. All right. So then the next question is explain why you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It is one of my favorite things to eat and it's quick, has some protein, not a lot of carbs, which is a good thing. And it's a comfort food for me. Okay. Now I remember. Boom, done. Boom, done. That's why you're the expert on that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's, um, we've looked at the prompt. Now let's look at each piece of the prompt and Jen is going to play our student for this session, and we're going to see how well she does on each part. Okay, so part A, referencing the scenario, there's that key phrase, describe the enumerated power in Article 1 of the Constitution that gives Congress the authority to regulate a business like the one above. So first things first, the business that you got to have read the scenario, because if you didn't read the scenario, you don't know that the business they're referring to is Facebook. So I can't just say, I can't just say business. Nope. Because you've got to reference the scenario. I mean, okay. you could, but you're not going to get the point. So make yeah. sure you say the actual business. That's why the prompt, or excuse me, that's why part A doesn't say to regulate Facebook. They want to know that you know that Facebook is the business. Oh, okay? they, and they want to know. Okay. And then they also want to know that you know which enumerated power we're talking about here. So okay. before we I reveal Jen's this. answer, I'd like you to hit pause on your video and go ahead and write your response to part A. And then we'll check and see if you have the same response as we do. Ooh, oh, I like that. That's good. It's like ASMR. <laughs> <laughs> was my All, right. Job. <laughs> All right. So. Let's see what Jen's answer was for this one. Congress has the enumerated power to regulate business through the Commerce Clause. So since Facebook is a company that exists in multiple states, Congress can enact legislation over the corporation. Beautiful. Okay, so we got a couple things here. We've got a reference to the scenario. So she, first of all, well, first of all, she says the business name is Facebook. You notice there's no direct quote from the scenario here. But because she mentioned Facebook, not only as the business, that's her scenario reference. So it's clear to us as the reader that she read it and she understands that this is connected to this scenario about the company of Facebook. OK, also, she specifically says the enumerated power is the power to regulate business through the Commerce Clause. Notice she didn't have to tell me that it's Article One, Section Eight, Clause Three. You don't have to be that specific. If you know that and you wanted to add that in there, you could, okay? But clearly it's the Commerce Clause, it's connected to Facebook, and it's because the company exists across state lines. That's why they can regulate it, okay? Or enact legislation over it. All right, now we're gonna look at part B. Explain how the two chamber structure of the legislature affects the ability of Congress to exercise the power described in part A. So the first thing I will mention here is the end of part B says described in part A. So that means that A and B are connected in this prompt. 
which also means that whatever power you mentioned in part A, you have to talk about again in part B. So Jen already talked about the Commerce Clause, which means it should probably come up again. Got to talk about it again. Got it. Sorry. Okay. All right. So before we see Jen's answer, go ahead and hit pause on your video, write your response, and we'll see how closely tied they are. All right. And let's see our part B. Since the House has two chambers, any legislation must pass through both houses to become enacted into law. So if either house doesn't decide to vote to pass the legislation, the bill over the corporation would fail. Mm, very good. Now, here's here's what we did here. So two chambers, that two chamber means bicameral. We're talking about the House. We're talking about the Senate. The question says, so how might Congress not be able to exercise? So, affecting the ability of Congress to exercise the power. If they want to use the Commerce Clause to regulate this business, which is Facebook, they've got to agree, okay? The House can't decide to do it without the Senate or vice versa, okay? And they basically said, if they both don't vote together to pass this legislation, this regulation, then the bill over the corporation could fail. Got to have both pieces, okay? They didn't have to get into the whole how the bill becomes a law process. They just had to say, both of them together agree, which is important. All right. And here it was Ooh. okay because there was no scenario in exactly. there. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. I got exactly. You. Good point. So she was allowed to just say corporation or business here because it doesn't say referencing the scenario or in the context of the scenario. She could have said Facebook here, but she didn't have to. Perfect. All right. Part C. If Congress decides to regulate how social media companies gather and use data of their users. Explain how these companies could use the political process to ensure that the new regulation does not negatively affect them. So part C is taking this scenario, taking what we've talked about in A and B, and now we're going to connect it to something else in AP GOPO. And in this case, we're going to say, okay, what could the recourse of the company be if Congress enacts a legislation that they don't like or that negatively affects them. So before we reveal Jen's answer, go ahead and hit pause and draft your answer. All right, Jen, let's see what you thought about part C. So I said, if companies decide that the legislation negatively affects them, they can sue the government and appeal that Congress's power under the Commerce Clause doesn't extend to the internet. This would bring the law in question under the Supreme Court and could declare the legislation unconstitutional. So, Jen, excellent. You actually gave us two for one in this point. OK, you gave us an option of they can sue the government. Um, they can appeal. OK, and then it could be left with the Supreme Court to use their power to declare the law unconstitutional. She didn't have to get very specific but she explained what would happen if this corporation wanted recourse against the government, which is important. And that's the connection that we want to make. Okay, now we want to see the other side of the question. All right. Well, three out of three, you win. You're on your Yay. way to a five on the AP exam. I'm Excellent job. All right. So with everything we've talked about this session, what should we take away? So our big takeaways are going to be everything to do with this concept application FRQ. Remember, this one is demonstrating our how and our why, how political concepts and processes work, why they work. I'm not going to forget the peanut butter and jelly sandwich now. Burned in my brain. Um, follow those task verbs. Avoid pronouns. Okay, Don't say I, I believe, I think. Just tell us. State the facts. We're here to read it. We believe you. Just tell us how it is. Okay. Okay. Um, Provide information from the stimulus. If it says reference the scenario, please, we beg of you, reference the scenario. I graded this, or excuse me, I scored this FRQ last year. Well, I'm doing the one we did in Monday is the one I actually um, scored. But it kills me not to give students points when they don't reference the scenario, when everything else is right, but they don't reference the scenario. So please, I beg of you, don't make me take points from you. Um, and last but not least, don't hunt for the like needle in the haystack, okay? Pick the most logical and appropriate answer to the prompt. These are not supposed to trick you, okay? We're not trying for you to come up with this big grandiose explanation for things. Just pick the most logical choice. And as Jen said earlier, 
Do the heavy lifting. Complete your thoughts. Don't make us as the readers trying to figure out what you're saying and what you're trying to explain. Make it clear. All right, Jen, before we wrap up for the evening, do you have any questions about the concept application other than you're so pumped to do one more next week? I don't think so. I think I'm okay, but I'm going to think about it over the week and Mm -hmm. see if I want to come back next Monday and ask a different question. Well, in the meantime, if you or any students watching need more practice on the concept application FRQ, you can find these AP daily videos in your AP classroom. Um, If you go to any of these unit and topic numbers, the concept application FRQ, either in its entirety or in parts, is going to be described in these videos, and you have access to those for practice. All right, guys, that is all we have for you this evening. So thank you very much, and we will see you tomorrow night to discuss the quantitative analysis FRQ. Bye. Bye.